welcome to the Grind Academy podcast. My name is Rob Patterson and I'm a former CEO from the hotel industry who turned the comfort of that life in to become an entrepreneur. Today I own several successful startups across various industries including retail, technology, property and lifestyle. If I can do all that coming from a tiny outback farming town in Australia, then anyone can do it. On my journey from becoming CEO of a large organisation to entrepreneurship, I became fascinated with what it takes to perform at your peak. Each week I'm introducing some of the most inspiring and talented minds from sport, business, literature and science to understand just what it takes. Thanks for joining the podcast, now let's meet today's guest. In this episode, I'm chatting with Brandy Dean and CEO in NHS Primary Care. In addition to her CEO role, Brandy holds various non-exec director roles as an advisory board member, a trustee, a justice of the peace, a guest lecturer, a mentor, and juggles all this with family life at home, including two twi- twin boys. Brandy is a strong advocate of societal equality and having been exposed to multiple boards and corporate structures across multiple industries, she has experienced firsthand the lack of equality and diversity and the relative snail pace speed these issues are being addressed globally. After studying a degree in HR and then gaining an honours degree in psychology, Brandy's career began in hospitality. She later switched to retail, working for supermarket chain Tesco, before returning to hospitality where she was eventually MD of our good friend Marco Pierre White's restaurant brands. At the beginning of the pandemic, Brandy made the switch to healthcare, unaware of what lie ahead. Since then, she has been actively involved in the vaccine rollout and had to establish herself in a new industry and role almost entirely and virtually, meaning no face-to-face contact for a long period of time. Brandy is a high-performing individual and has proven leadership is leadership, and it crosses verticals. A role model for so many young women across the globe, I found Brandy's energy and passion for learning simply inspiring. If you're already having conversations about diversity and equality in the workplace, then this is a podcast for you. If you're thinking about switching industries but aren't quite sure how to approach it, this is a podcast for you. If you just want to hear from one of the highest performing CEOs in the UK, then this podcast is also for you. I hope you enjoy it. Now let's get started. Brandy, thank you for being uh, on the show today. When we first met, you were working with Marco Pierre White and the black and white brands uh, in restaurants. And today you're in NHS primary healthcare. How on earth did that happen? Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on, uh, Rob. It's a pleasure to see you again, um, albeit virtual. <laughs> um, yes, we, you know, we first met uh, in, 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 in a site in Kent uh, when we opened a joint venture between, um, between an MPW, Mark White Restaurant and yourself, didn't we? We had so much fun with that. Um, it that was restaurant. great. It was yeah. fabulous, the location, the people. Um, yes, yeah, so that's where we met. So that's, um, well, I had been in hospitality uh, for about just over 20 years up until um, last year, really, beginning of last, uh, yeah, last year. Um, and, and I spent all my life in hospitality. Um, and then I kind of switched uh, over, I think it's a year ago today um, that I switched over to NHS Primary Care. Um so yeah, I kind of started off um, as a graduate uh, in, within Hilton um, in, in one of those graduate uh, programs. Actually, it was one of the very first ones that went through the program. So had quite a lot of lovely attention, um, and then and then kind of rattled through that uh, single site management, went into multi site management, moved on uh, to work with Travel Lodge, and then moved to restaurants uh, with, with Bread, um, and then of course I did a spin at Tesco as well, so retail, uh, British Airways, and then when we met at MP, MPW. So yeah, worked in hospitality, retail, aviation, in healthcare, um, and healthcare. But in terms of healthcare, uh, you asked specifically how it came about. I, I've just been so passionate about inequalities for a very, very, very long time. Um, you know, from as long as I can remember. Um, and it's sort of inequalities of all aspects, you know, educational inequalities, health inequalities, um, all of those uh, kind of inequalities. And so uh, when this opportunity came to actually do something in primary care, it, it was just brilliant because, of course, primary care is the front door of our NHS. So um, general practice, dental, eye care, pharmacy, all sits within primary 
care. So um, in terms of talk about really bridging inequalities, you can do it there. If you can't do it there, I don't know where else you could. So for me, it was it was a non-starter, really. Yeah, right. Well, not only are you a CEO for the NHS, you're a non-exec director, you're a justice of the peace, you're, you're a guest lecturer, you sit on several boards and you're juggling family life at home. What is your superpower? <laughs> Oh, I wish I had a superpower. Um, you know, the superpower really is actually organize organize my chaotic aspects of my life. Um, uh, so yes, I you know I live in rural Britain. Why is that important? Because I don't live in a city, which means everywhere every time I have to go into a meeting, I have to get up super early because I've got to uh-huh. leave the village, hit the motorways, get out of rural Britain, and then get into into the cities. Um, I have twin boys who are 14. Um, why is that important? It's because they've got to that age where actually you just can't say one thing once and it gets done. You've got to repeat yourself and actually get quiet and forceful uh, before it gets done. Um, you know, so I do have a, a really strict sort of lifestyle and a, a lifestyle and family time. I just need to make sure that it's kind of organized like my work life. Um, I, I build in um, all the I kind of bridge the gaps of all the rocky ends uh, within normal uh, family life. Um, you know, the, I, I always say to myself, the only one who can tell you you can't do it is is just yourself. So actually, don't listen love to that, yourself. Love that. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, love that, love that. Uh, so, so you've you've um you talked about already working through Hilton and that hospitality. You switched really once into retail with Tesco, so this is not the first time you've switched. But you studied, interestingly, HR and psychology. So when you come out of university, having studied psychology, what made you think I'm going to go into hotels? <sighs> The truth of the matter, Rob, is I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I, I went to uni thinking, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll read that. And then I finished my first degree and I thought, I don't want to go home. I just want to stay and do something else. So I stayed on and, and did my um, MSc. Um, and then it was a bit like, actually, I probably need to go home and get myself a job kind of thing. So I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. You know, when I speak, I do talk to quite a lot of um, school, school children. And I always say to them, don't worry too much if you haven't got a clue what you want to do, because I never did. Uh, that's not what I tell my friends. 14-year-old boys. <laughs> <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> yeah, they're not listening. Um, so it, it was just, like I said, that there is a bit of, there's something in me, Rob, that is nicely chaotic but still nicely planned. Very difficult to describe, but it's always been, you know, that there's a bit of me that is haphazard, but actually there's always a plan behind it. And I always make sure that out of any chaos, I have a plan around it. Um, So I didn't have a clue in in all honesty. but I was really lucky because I had a Saturday job um, in, in, in a Hilton um, when I was at university. Um, and so I, I was very, I grew up in hospitality. And so when I came out, um, I then decided to work in human resources. So I started working in HR and I found myself sat in an office. And um, it was personal in those, those days, if you remember those days. Um, and I, I just happened to, by accident, do a duty management shift one day. And, and as you well know, in hotel duty management is fun. You're out there, you're talking to people, you're running around. And I thought, this is just me. So I just fell into operations and have stayed. So it's, it's just really been sort of a, a random journey, which has come good. Yeah, yeah. We'll get back to um, you spoke about equality before, and I want to talk about that a little bit shortly. But before we get there, I'm interested to know there's a lot of people who um, get go through their career and doing really well. You're clearly a very high flyer. Uh, and along the way, you've had twin boys, not just one, but you've had two boys, and you've managed to maintain a really high-performing, successful career. Uh, can you tell me about some of the challenges that you faced during that time and, and what made you say, I'm going to stick with this, I'm going to keep going, and where a lot of people perhaps say, well, actually, I'm going to prioritise my, my children for a while. How do you juggle mm-hmm. the two? Yeah, so I, I, I've always been very, very focused, um, if, if, I'm, if I'm honest. I've always had a, had a, I'm a planner, so I always plan. Um, so even, you know, being a CEO, I've been planning it since, since I'd say, since my um, early 20s. But of course, the, the challenges I've faced has been in different, sort of different decades. You know, in, in my 20s, the challenges were very different from what I'm facing now. Um, so 
the fact that I can micro focus has been really good for me. I need to make sure that my life is super organized because, like you said, it's not just the day job, it's all the other spin offs that I have that actually keeps me excited as an individual that I need to have, um, you know, alongside my, my day job and, and the family life. So, real focus, making sure that, you know, I live my life with planners. So making sure that I've got quite a lot of planning around me, you know, um, my phones are actually off. Otherwise, you know, within every hour, you'll have things like have a tea or have a coffee or take your medication or whatever it is I need to do, I get reminded. So that's, that's really good uh, from that perspective in terms of sort of self-focus. Um, then I also have an element of me that is very intense. So I don't do things lightly. I enjoy intensity in life. I, you know, if I'm reading, I'm quite intense with reading. Anything I do has got intensity. And I think that's really helped me because when times have been really tough, I've just sort of used my intensity and have made sure that I've got short spouts of actually um, feeling a little bit low, but then giving, you know, giving myself a little bit of a boost again, a bit like the booster jabs, you know, boosting myself <laughs> again. <laughs> Well, it's impossible to be like on the high the whole time. You sometimes you've got to go through the lows, don't you? And you've got to experience those and live them and acknowledge them and and get through them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a, there's, a, there's a, a thin line of fragility in me as well. Um, and, and I do allow myself to get fragile and break sometimes. Um, and I'm able to, but of course, that, that intensity means that my, even my fridge, fragile moments are quite intense. And then I go back to actually, I'm able to pick myself up again because of the focus that I have uh, through all the techniques that I've, all, I've learned to use to just keep myself going. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I also need to make sure that I've, I've got a vision. And I think vision always holds me. Um, and, and, and that's really, really key. Uh, and it, for me, it's important that I'm in charge of every day and not the day that, so that the day doesn't run me because otherwise I, I, I get quite disorientated. So do you have like a quite a, a tight routine that you wake up at a certain time and this is what I do? Is it very consistent or, or is each day slightly different? No, I'm quite consistent in terms of, you know, I, I go to bed the same time every evening. I wake up the same time every morning, which can be quite annoying on a weekend because sometimes you want to lie in and you can't do that. Um, so I, I am a routine uh, person, but I, I also have some chaotic aspects of my life, which has got sort of routine bubbled around it. So because of that, when I actually go into chaotic situations or, or new scenarios, I don't crumble because I do allow some chaos in my life as well, which allows me to be able to get through that. So that's always very helpful. So you talk about um, the changing environment and how uh, managing that through a, a routine bubble. How important was that when you switched into NHS primary care from hospitality, which are really two very, very different um, professions? Not only did you switch big professions but at a time when the pandemic was hitting how, how did how did you cope with that um it, it was tough actually uh, it was the very first time i i started a a role and not see people do it virtually so if i'm honest i didn't know how to start a role um virtually it was the very first time um it was my first ceo appointment um and so i really didn't know how to be a CEO um, and, but I've always believed that actually you, you don't get things done by wishing you don't get things done uh, by hoping or drooling you just get things done by actually doing it um, you know that action has got to to, to, to to come in and and if something doesn't challenge me it doesn't change me so um, from that premise it was important to me to actually remember the synergies between these all these roles, because actually you see um, retail, aviation, hospitality, healthcare, they're all the same. You know, you take aviation and healthcare, for instance, you know, those two sectors have been going hundreds of years. Um, you know, for both aviation and healthcare, uh, the equipment and the crew 
are, have got to be specials in. So, you know, you just don't get up and become a doctor. You just don't wake up one morning and become a pilot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the crew, are, you know, the teams around the doctors, the, the teams around the pilots are either crew on the plane uh, and, and, and the crew uh, within um, a healthcare setting are highly skilled, highly trained. Um, the service users are similar. You know, people jump on a plane just not because they want to be there. It's because they need that service to get to where they're going to. People come... Uh, into primary care and to see their GPs not because they want to be there they need that service that support to be able to carry on because they're not they're not well safeguarding for instance is very similar in, in, in both um uh, environments Safe, mm-hmm. safeguarding is, is high and, and so is safety so just those two sectors alone tells you how similar it is when it comes to, to say hospitality maybe and and retail for instance as well there's blurred lines you know hospitality thrives as you know on ambience and, and the environment and so does retail retail leverages technology and so the, that's hospitality so from that perspective the sectors have all been i think the sectors are really similar the same skills are required to be successful in any sector. I mean, I call myself a non-binary leader and I want, you know, I can lead in any sector because it's the same skills that we all need. You just need to apply it very differently and you need to dedicate your mindset to that sector um, and and appreciate the fact that um, you're new into that sector and so you need to allow yourself to go through that learning curve, um, which is exactly what I did when I started this new role. Yeah, and albeit remotely. So uh, you had a team, I guess, that you were talking to through Zoom or Teams or something like that to learn the role. That was that's a whole another layer of complication. So I, I mean, I take my hat off to you. It's such a such a big challenge. Working with the NHS must be incredibly rewarding as well as being challenging over the last twelve months. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the remote aspect of it is interesting because I actually didn't meet some people until the first lockdown got lifted. So I think I went for about six, seven months before I met my own <laughs> team. Um, but you forget you haven't met them because you're on Zoom all the time and Teams all the time. So you're kind of sat in the middle of a meeting and going, oh, actually, it's our first time meeting, isn't it? Type thing. <laughs> <laughs> That was just sort of interesting um, from the, from that perspective, um, but you know it was great learning. Like I said, nobody could have planned for for that. Um, in terms of reward, yes, it is. You know, a, a year in a row now, I, I find it really reward. I've done nothing like this before, um, so I, I find it genuinely. Um, I, I've always found end to end process is quite rewarding anyway. But you can see in healthcare, you know, um, you, you just see it happen. It's it's it's, it's a bit like magic. You actually see it happen. That end to end sort of rewarding. So so yes, I, I do find it really really rewarding, and to be a part of that family, uh, that sort of uh, primary care family within yeah. the NHS, it's quite cool. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine. So. Um, I want to go on to a topic that I know is very dear to your heart and, and it's a topic that I think a lot of companies are really challenged with and, and are trying to find the right way forward and it's um, equality in the workplace and gender equality in the workplace specifically. I know I came from a business where on our board of directors we had one female representative out of eight and in our situation it wasn't because we wanted we wanted to have a greater uh, equality on the board not just gender but uh, diversity as well but we couldn't find the application the applicants for the board as much as we tried to encourage it what what do you think needs to happen in the corporate world today to improve the balance of corporate boards specifically okay so there's a couple of things so let, let's let's tackle the sort of the diversity aspect and then we'll, we'll pick the gender equality aspects of it so when i think diversity Rob I think so many facets of it I think gender diversity I think age I Mm. think ethnicity I think nationality I think mental health I think social economic status I think sexual orientation I think parenthood I think disability and religious belief so for me it is a wide spectrum from from um, from from a diversity aspect but here's the thing this is the bit that I get quite passionate about Uh, about female leaders because 
in the foot and I'll just bring it right down to the UK because that's that's where I know most but in our FTSE 100 organizations um only six percent in 2021 six percent of these CEOs were female yeah so that's 94 male CEOs and six female CEOs in FTSE uh 100 then but then you know times have changed things have moved on haven't they um of course they have. Between 2016 uh, and 2021, of course it's moved. We went from five female CEOs to six female CEOs by one. Put it to 250, you would think actually nice entry level. Uh, no, 5% uh, of the CEOs are female. For the 350, 2% are female. We could go on. Mm. So for me, there's a real problem. Um, and diversity, you know, as you alluded to, in the boardroom is, is, is a real challenge. And I think the past few years has been good, Rob, to see because we've seen more women in director roles. And it starts from there. If we don't get into C-suite, we'll never really get to the CEO levels. So more women are doing it. Non-exec directorship is helping because we've got a few women in non-executive director roles. But we still need to keep going because we haven't got to, until we stop this nonsense of a few percentage of female mm-hmm. CEOs in our FTSE organisations, we won't break the barrier mm-hmm. because um, we've got so many things that we, we've got to do in the corporate world. We've got to foster mentorship um, because you, you just can't be what you can't see. Mm-hmm. And unless you actually mentor young people to come through the ladder, it's going to be really difficult. We've got to elevate our role models. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't see many role models. Um, within hospitality, I had one. And I mentioned Karen Forrester's name everywhere that I go. Because when I was in my early 20s coming up within hospitality, there was this amazing CEO. And she used to run TJ Fridays. Karen Forrester, her name was. And she was a CEO there. And I used to just look at her, you know, and then go, oh, I want to be like Karen. She had this charisma and she was just so good at what she did so role modeling got me thinking i want to be like karen forrester and so we got to really elevate the role models the few female role models that we have our social fabric has got to change as well it's just not right you know we still in 2021 we still have women doing more of the domestic aspect of family life than men you know, we're getting better. We haven't shared parenthood, but the social fabric isn't isn't great. In organisations, and, I, and I've been in corporate land, um, you still have meetings being scheduled at 7 a.m. or 9 p.m. I mean, if you're a, 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 a mum, how are you how are you meant to actually attend these meetings? So you're being dialed out and not even given the chance. Our hiring techniques are just not right. We're still hiring in some cases through bias. There is no clear evaluations. You know, people look at people and think, oh, I can have a beer with them. They'll do. Um, You know, we've still got to make sure that we're having honest evaluations. We've got to really make sure that the corporate pipeline is actually quite clear and full because at the minute it is really leaky because if we look around us if you look at the, the countries that have good uh, gender um, equality the norways of the world finland iceland luxembourg you know scandi is brilliant for promoting but they've always supported women um, and they have visible women so if I am a team member working anywhere and I see one of the top bosses who's female, I then can connect and know that I can be that person. But if a board is still, you know, I think we've got to ban an all male or all female board. It just doesn't work, does it? You know, if it's not diverse enough, then it actually doesn't um, filter through. Um, but I'm also I'm also conscious, um, Rob, about sort of that whole um diversity fatigue you know people get you know I, I remember having a conversation with a friend a couple of weeks ago because do you, do you think we, we get into diversity um, fatigue and and my answer was actually giving up now is simply not an option we've got to take the high road and we've got to go higher we're on a trajectory now and we've got to keep building on it yeah absolutely you know my personal experience on the board and you can only really take from your personal experience is that when um when we had our full board we, there was one lady on the board and when she was there, the meetings were just so much more productive. It took out all of the ego. It took out all of the 
uh, innuendo and boys kind of, I guess, club. I hate to say that, but that's the reality. And and it just made it so much more functional. So our team, we always loved it when when she turned up to the to, when she was at the board meetings, and it wasn't the same. So it's clear just in our everyday lives what a difference it makes when you've got diversity. Um, in any group, whether it's a board, whether it's a leadership team, do you take a lot of encouragement from what's happened in the last sort of, I guess, 18 months with, um, you know, I think some of the biggest, you know, leaders in the, in the world stage now are women. I mean, you, you take Jacinda Ardern, I think she's been the star of the, of managing the country. You'd have to say that and Angela Merkel's done a really, really good job in, in Germany. I know they've had their challenges, but she's led so well. And then, of course, you've got the United States, Kamala Harris now has the uh, first Madam Vice President. There must be some courage, I guess, some encouragement to take over the last 18 months and the steps forwards uh, for, for on the global stage. There is, there is. I mean, you, you, you checked three and you probably could check maybe six and then you would be spitting heads. Um, so whilst I appreciate that we've moved forward and, I, and, and I'm loving uh, everything um, that's happening, you know, you look at the, the prime minister, you know, you, you look at the um, the leaders of, um, of of some of this kind of, even Iceland's got female, um, you know, you look at some of those areas, there's, there's loads of them, you can get to about seven or eight and then you start you're going, um, 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 it gets difficult. Um, and so uh, I, I think the past couple of years has been brilliant. Um, but, but then we've got, to, we've got to close that gap because according to Wells Statistica, this is not coming from me, but Wells Statistica, from a societal demographic perspective, um, the number of years it's going to take for us to actually close the gender equality gap is scary. In Western Europe, we've got 52 years before we close that gender gap. Um, in North America, 61 years before we close the gender equality societal gap. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, it's 68 years. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it is 121. Um, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, it's 134. And in South Asia, it's 195 years. That's scary. That is not yeah. in the time of my twin boys. It's not even in the time of their children or their children. So we've got to, we haven't got the, the luxury to still be counting less than 10 figure names. We've got to share power more. We've got to challenge all our behaviors. We've got to have these tough conversations. We've got to support women's movements. Um, we've got to get to the stage where there's, it's nothing about women without women you know women have got to be in the room and all decision making we live in in in, in a um, in a country if i bring it to sort of the uk where it's a 50 50 split you know from a gender perspective so and yet we're still counting very few women um which is quite scary really really scary so whilst to your question whilst i appreciate that we have moved forward a very long um long way from you know, from from as long as I can remember, because I've I've been I've been banging on this this drum since since I was a teenager. You know, got myself in trouble so many times as a teenager because I told people off uh, for no. something that they shouldn't have. <laughs> um, it just needs to move forward a little bit more. Um, I think it's yeah, we we've got a lot more to do. Yeah, that's quite scary to hear. I didn't wasn't aware of those numbers, and that's quite quite scary. Surely there are things that we can do to accelerate that. Do you think? There are more things that government needs to do, or companies need to do, or is it is it is it a mixed, a joint effort for everyone? I think it's a societal issue. So by being a societal issue, it becomes everybody's problem. Um, I I think allies have got. I mean, I know that I've got to where I am in my career because of allies, and it's been male allies really that have supported me majority of the time. Um, female role, role models have really been key for me as well um, uh, because I've looked up to them. Um, so I think it's, it, from that small bubble, it's a society, it's, it's a sort of a, all of us, it's all our concerns. So government has got a role to play in it. Um, Organisations have got a role to play in it. Families have got a role to play in it. Um, everybody's got a role to play in it. And I think it's, it's not hard. It starts from actually being very honest about where we're at. Um, and, and making a conscious effort, real conscious effort to actually fix the problem. Because if it was anything else, if it was the other way around, we would have fixed it. If it was anything else, we would have fixed it. 
but it's because it's not a ma- it's not a female dominated world. <laughs> we have to wait for the decisions to be slowly made um, by our lovely male counterparts from that perspective. Um, so we just need to just just get it done um, and 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 stop sort of almost um, dancing around it the issue. And it's really good to see all the changes happening. Um, it's brilliant. You know, I I spoke to a, a group of uh, teenagers maybe two weeks ago. And the fire in Denver was just, you know, 13, 14 year olds talking about gender diversity, females um, talking about gender diversity with so much passion. That fills me with joy because their generation will start fixing more um, if our generation, it's a bit like a climate change conversation, isn't it? Um, If this generation doesn't do it, the next generation will do more of it. So I'm encouraged by that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question personally for you now. Um, in, in my career growing up, I was fortunate to have several very strong women as, as mentors as well in my career. But something that struck me is they were probably the toughest bosses that I had and, um, and mentors. Uh, and I felt sometimes, or do you feel sometimes that you need to be strong in the boardroom or be strong in a, in a leadership role, extra strong and overcompensate in some senses? And I want to say this in the most respectful possible way. I'm just interested to get your your opinion on this. Yeah, I think um, in the earlier parts of my career, leadership was very different. So when I was kind of growing up in my career, so I'll say middle management, there were times that I felt I had to because leadership was very different and it wasn't my style. And so when I tried to, it was very difficult to actually take me serious. And so I learned very, very quickly to actually just, just be me. Um, because I've always been, been me, just quite lively and quite, um, you know, just very, uh, very grounded and, and sort of um, love the teams. That, that whole non-hierarchical leadership has always been me. Um, and, I, I, and I would take it into what I would call adult rooms, which is the sort of boardrooms type thing. Um, but I think leadership has changed, Rob, and I think certainly what I've seen in the past sort of, I'd say, five, six years is that um, leadership has now become a bit more kinder and warmer. And years ago, actually having mindful leadership wasn't a thing, whereas now it is. So I am quite comfortable going into a boardroom and being strong when I need to. But I'm also quite comfortable sitting back and, and letting the boys just, as I call them, just, just talk among themselves for a bit and then just kind of take a laid back approach. And it's actually quite normal now um, in, in most boardrooms. And, and, and you're right. I mean, I, I, I had a couple of really strong female uh, mentors, but I actually thinking back now, it was because they were just strong women. Yeah. Um, and, you know, years back, only strong women could get to the very top. For us, actually, now, any woman, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't describe Justin the Arden as a really strong woman, would you? But you would describe her, her as a very great, uh, mindful, yeah. uh, empathetic leader. And that kind of cuts it as well. So I think it's different strokes for different folks. And depending on the stage of an organization, because let's face it, in some organizations, at certain stages of the organizational life cycle, it needs a very different type of leader. Um, yeah. And in some organizations, depending on where the organization is, it could, it probably would require a just in the Raden type uh, leader or a very sort of masculine type leader as well. It, it really does depend. But I think it's all very acceptable um, now, personally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see a concerted effort in the NHS or do you see a change in the, in the air in the NHS for gender equality? I, I do, I do. Um, but then I think I think the NHS has always had quite a lot of female leaders there, though. Help, not just the NHS, I think healthcare itself has actually always had quite a lot of female. I, I must admit, this is the only sector I've worked in where I sit around a boardroom and there's other or in meters and there's other women around me. Uh, it's a nice luxury to have because certainly in my other roles. I would certainly almost always be the only female around boardrooms. Um, whereas I don't see that in healthcare. But I, you know, if I kind of look beyond what I see, it's always had a good mix of that 
gender, female, male balance um, from that perspective, because you have quite a lot of um, clinicians that kind of move up into leadership and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so from a healthcare perspective, I, I never had actually noticed that um, there, was, there was a challenge. But sort of as of now and what, what everybody else is doing, I think the NHS is doing a good job. I think most organisations, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to say almost 99% of organisations around the world maybe are either conscious of diverse, they may not be doing anything about yeah. it, but they're conscious of the di- whole diversity conversation or somebody within the organisation around the decision-making table is conscious about diversity, whether they do something about it or not, it's another matter. But you would have to be living under a rock the past couple of years not to be thinking, talking, singing, dancing diversity. Well, on that point, would you... Um, I, I'm sure a lot of people would sit and say, well, it's about having the best candidate at that point in time, irrespective of um, gender, uh, age, whatever it might be, um, diverse, diversification. It's about having the best candidate. What would you say to somebody who says, well, I'm not going to have a policy of it, which is you know, to, to, make a, to make a change and a concerted effort. I'm just going to recruit the best person who comes for the job. Should we have a policy or should they just say, well, I'm just going to go for the best person at the time? Yeah, go, go for the best person, but make sure they're not in your image. Make sure you're not recruiting them because they sound like you, look like you. Mm-hmm. Um, go to the same golf club as you do, that kind of stuff. You know, are they, are they, do they have a very different gender from you? Do they have a different religious belief from you? Because if they do, they'll challenge you. Do they have a d- different either visible or invisible disability from you? Because actually if they do, they will challenge you. You know, are they a parent and you're not? Or are you a parent and they're not? Because that will challenge you as well. Do they have a different sexual re- orientation? Do they come from a socioeconomic status as you? Or are you all privately educated or are you all sort of of, um, you know, sort of uh, a different type of uh, education. Are they a different nationality from you? Are they very different age from you? Because they will challenge your thinking. Are they a different ethnicity from you? Because they will challenge your thinking. Um, and are they a different race from you? Because they'll challenge your thinking. Because, so, so for me, that I answer that question with, if you think the right person is the person that looks like you, sounds like you, because of our own internal inherent biases, mm-hmm then you crack on because what you're going to have is that whole echo chamber of people that all sound and look like you, which means the decision making will be through one tunnel vision because we're all seeing things the same way, which means that the product that you get out is going to be very, very similar to what everybody around the table is. But when you actually get it out to the customers, your customers are going to go, actually, this doesn't represent us because they may not be like the people that are sat around the table. So I would answer it by actually questioning what the right candidate looks like, because the, we, we, the leaders, the, um, the decision makers are the ones that will write the job description, right? They're the ones that are going to say who the right candidate mm-hmm. is. So they've got it in their head on paper, but that's all great. That's all the hard stuff. But what about the, soft, the softer bits mm-hmm. of, of diversity, which is when they come and sit, in front of you if they look like you sound like you smile like you they've got a better chance haven't they frankly than somebody that is very different from you that would potentially um not agree with you most times yeah yeah it's a it's a good point and and i wonder how many times that's actually taken into consideration in in an interviewing process you know who's going to challenge us the most i'm not sure if it's a i've never heard that question (laughs) so i wonder how much that could so uh, Moving on from the uh, women um, or gender equality, um, I want to talk about diversity in the workplace, which we've already started to touch on a fair bit. And again, I think in recent times, we've seen some really um, cool um, advancements. I think we've still got, which I think is great, the Premier League taking the knee before the, before the game and other countries have kind of turned their back on that. But the Premier League have kept it. And I think that's really positive. We've got Lewis Hamilton, the absolute greatest of all time, um, racing car driver and he's really pushing the, t- the subject in an industry I think there's 40,000 people and there's less than 1% um, outside of being white European um, 
there's been some steps forward, but are we going fast enough again? Is this, is this another one we're going to be waiting for decades before we see real diversity? Are we going fast enough? But we're, we're looking at it this way. Um, I, I left hospitality um, at the end of 2020. What were we in? Are we in 2022? So I, I, yeah, I left at the end of 2021, I think. And at the stage, at the time that I left, I think in 2020, um, when I um, was recognised uh, with it, within Black British uh, Business Awards, I was the only Black female MD um, in branded restaurants in um, in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. So I just going to stew a little bit. This is 2022. Yeah. Then yeah. 2021 it was. That was a bit scary. Really, really scary. Um, so the whole race equality thing is interesting. I think um, everything that happened in the States a couple of years ago um, has actually opened up a lot of conversations. I think it's a good thing. Uh, people are having conversations about, about that sort of those kind of conversations um, and it's not awkward to have them anymore which is a good thing um, the people you mentioned the Louises of the world um, are doing their, their, their bit to actually bring awareness um, and, and you know in a way um, I, I worry that I, I certainly felt felt this way um, when I realised that um, at that stage when, when I got recognised by Black Riches Business Awards I was the only black female MD uh, in branded restaurants in the UK. It was a bit Sorry. scary, actually. Mm-hmm. You have this weight on you when you are, I can speak to myself, when you are a role model um, of colour uh, and, and then try slapping on being a female role model of colour as well. You have this weight on you uh, that you need, to, you need to do something for the next gen. Um, and I don't think that's right. I think it's got to be all our problems. And so um, I, I am hoping um, that in 10, 15 years time, it won't be a thing anymore. It will be everybody else's problem. And I was really encouraged by the events that happened a couple of years ago that we were all aware of from a race perspective because it got the conversation going. So I think we're in a better place um, as a society throughout the world um, than, than we were years ago. We are all aware of the huge inequalities that uh, bestow people that are different. And I think we're all doing our very best to make sure that at least we're educated because when, I know that when we're educated, we think differently, we do things differently. And so I'm really encouraged by that. But I think, Rob, it's one of those things that those conversations that will have to carry on. Mm -hmm. Um, And every generation will have to have people that have the mouthpiece um, to actually have those conversations on behalf of others. Um, And so for me, I've been really, really clear that, and I I say this to a lot of women of colour as well, if you have the platform, if you're lucky enough to have the platform, for God's sake, do something about it, you know, um, because you are in that position and there's a lot of women looking at you. There's a lot of other people uh, watching you to do something for them to break through. So I think that's really key. Yeah, um, I, I share one of my own vulnerabilities here. I, I watch, I'm a um, huge 49ers fan, uh, so I've watched Colin Kaepernick play and loved how he played and, and actually even that very first game that he took the knee when it was nothing when, and now it's turned into a global phenomenon. But recently he did a documentary and I don't know if you've seen it, but um, I watched that. And I think when I watched that, I saw parts of that program in myself and felt embarrassed almost and felt, wow. And it was, it was really about the awareness to say, hang on, I can see some of that in me. And I don't know if you've seen the documentary. No, I haven't. I haven't. Absolutely phenomenal. And I came to the end of it and just thought, wow, some of that behavior you're completely oblivious to. But I, I recognize that I was that person at some point or another. And, you, you know, I think there was a real uh, moment of awareness through that program. I yeah, recommend I watching it. Yeah, that's, that's the magic of education and self-awareness, isn't it? Because it comes and then people are reformed. Because I think, um, you know, you when you have lived experience you take the lived experience for granted doesn't matter where the lived experience is 
um, and, and what it's about. And I think because you take it for granted, you, you don't talk about it. Um, you know, if you live in a mansion and you've always lived in a mansion, you, you know, what, what's, the, what's the big deal? Whereas actually, if you have another lived, lived experience, you just don't understand each other's worlds. And I think that the more we educate ourselves and educate others and have those conversations, the better it is for all of us. So that people that don't have the luxury of lived experience can actually have a taste of maybe a glimpse of that um, that experience to be able to inform them yeah. to do it slightly differently. Yeah, well, on the flip, on the on the positive side, <laughs> we've talked about all some of the some of the issues. But I, I worked in a team. I remember in uh, probably about fifteen years ago, which um, which there was no two people from the same country, and we had the best time ever because every Friday we would have we would have Friday food day, and everyone would bring in food from their home to home country. It was just the best. So you, you're missing out if you haven't got diversification in your workplace. <laughs> <laughs> so so talking about i want to talk about the corporate room now uh the corporate environment i i, I think um so much has changed in the last 18 months two years and i'm not sure the corporate world has moved with it and i want to get your opinion on this in a post-pandemic world in where people have had a taste of far more freedom and flexibility at home a greater balance in life how is it for the NHS, for example, in a work-life balance in a post-pandemic world where people might want to work with more flexibility, work from home, whatever it might be? How is it in the NHS? Do you think it's moving, you know, yeah, in line I mean, with I, where? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 the, the whole corporate thing, I'll just talk, talk about it gener generically because I've seen it in a very generic manner. So, um, yes. And, and, you know, that whole revolution is more around mindsets, I, I think. Um, because we know mindsets can be can be so much of, of, of a blockage, can't mm. can't they? But yeah. they also enable uh, behavioral change and can actually allow leaders to grow and to expand and people to grow and to expand. So I can see it in the mindset. And I've observed four actually, I think four or five, perhaps four, um, things happening from a from a, a, a corporate revolution perspective. I think the first one for me is physical movement. So you know, I'm realizing people are no longer going to work. Work is coming to people, so you can stay anywhere. I mean, like we today, uh, you are doing work, 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 and quote, quote, unquote, <laughs> right? You're in a garden. I'm in my home office. Um, you know, years ago, we would have to meet somewhere. Probably be hard, given that we're on different continents. But um, you know, that's what would have happened. Um, so physical movement is, is is just very radical now. So you know, no, we're no longer going going to work. Work is coming to us at home, and so we, we, you know, it, there's, there's a nice blend there. So that's the first revolution that I'm seeing. I'm also seeing a resource revolution. Um, that, that whole presenteeism. When I started my career, you had to be present. You know, the boss went past and you weren't there. You, you were in big trouble. And um, that's changed. And it's come with leadership as well. It's actually changed. It's now about trust and self-governance. You know, you've got to trust the employees. You've got to trust the teams. And people have got to self-govern themselves. So if you don't have any self-governance filters as, as you're growing up in your career, you've had it. Because I think, give me another six, seven years, and the emphasis will shift from the corporate um, leaders to actually the, the employees and the teams governing themselves. So that's a skill on its own to, 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 to kind of learn. Um, and I think the third one, which I think was actually elevated by the pandemic, is the location piece. You know, it's all very mm. virtual now. Talent is in the cloud, is the, is the norm. You know, talent is scattered around the cloud. You don't go um, to, to go find talent in a big building anymore. Uh, you've got to look in the cloud and that's normal. So and I think the pandemic is actually elevated that for us and then the fourth one the final one which for me i find quite exciting and interesting it's actually a service revolution within corporate um so you know years ago it was all about test and learn wasn't it let's test it test 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 and let's learn let's try again it was all about um personal personalized solutions but the very dull personalized solutions very simple very mundane mm -hmm. very unimagined customer experience you know old stuff um it's not like that anymore. You know, I think in the next few years, it's all going to be the revolution around service, 
um, is going to be more interaction uh, between digital and visible. And I think there's going to be enhanced capacity for convergence of tech and psychology. I can see mm-hmm. behavioral and social psychology playing and tech playing bigger parts in everything we do than the usual sort of dull, personalized stuff that we've been doing. So I think yeah. things are changing so quickly. It's unreal. And, and that's where I think our mindsets are going to be ahead of us. And they're going to help us to get that revolution done. Yeah. Using the first name in an email is no longer personal. It's just not enough. <laughs> <laughs> so last year. That's what I <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. I mean, I, I think there is a time for that now is the time for a big corporate revolution. And whether that's got to do with flexibility or shorter working weeks and whatever it might be, I think there's time right now for a, a, a pirate attitude of let's um let's let's revamp things a little bit. Um so sw- switching um switching gears, um I, I wanted to um ask you about there's three questions I want to ask you because I'm sure lots of people want to know. Um, three questions. What first one is? What is your number one piece of business advice? What is your number two? Is what is your number one piece of life advice? Getting deep now, and uh, and number three. What is your favorite quote? Okay, so business advice, life advice, favorite quote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, business advice. I think. Um, I would say always operate with a purpose and connect heavily. I think magic happens when you you connect with people within uh, within business and magic happens when you have a purpose and you're operating around your purpose. I credit much of my success and always making a point to truly get to know people. Mm -hmm. And I credit a lot of my business advice to organizations where I actually really um, bought into the purpose so I think that would be the business advice life advice that's an interesting one <laughs> I would say <laughs> mistakes happen um you know we need to accept when they when, you know that we don't always make the right decisions um and, and actually if we have a royal uh mess up it's okay you know uh, mistakes happen um and, and i think everybody knows this is it's what you learn from the mistakes that's, that's important so i i used to go through my life freaking out about mistakes not anymore i really don't um so 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 i would say that's the life advice quote ah i'm gonna have to quote greta thunberg because i just love that lady you know her ideologies uh, on one side, but as an individual, you know, young woman trying to bring about change. That's just brilliant. And she says something that really touches my heart each day. You're never too small to make a difference. And I believe that's really true. We can all make a difference, can't we? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. I love that. Brandy, you've been amazing. Your personality is so cool. Um, and I love your dress sense, by the way, as well. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. You, I'm sure so many young girls are looking up to you and thinking, you know, I want to be like Brandy one day. So thank you so much for who you are and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Rob. Lovely to see you. And, and you take care in the sun. Don't have too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I want to thank my guest today, Brandy Deenan. I enjoyed her openness to discuss some really important topics and the energy and passion she pours into everything she does. If you like the podcast, let me know by posting and tagging me in on Instagram, grind.equity. You can also head on over to the website and sign up to have the weekly podcast sent directly to your inbox. Thank you for listening to the Grind Academy today and I wish you and your loved ones a wonderful week.